Marie Harvey, the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. And welcome to our research seminar. Um, I'm delighted that we have people here in the room. And of course, all of you who are joining us via Zoom. So um, I'm first going to introduce Jonathan Garcia, who is an Associate Professor in the Global Health Program. Please note that the Global Health Program is sponsoring the seminar. So um, we're delighted that Jonathan is here to actually introduce our speaker and to uh, facilitate this seminar. And he'll tell you a bit more about what you should do if you're coming in via Zoom to ask questions. Oh, you got it? I got it. Okay, yeah. so I'll uh, let me introduce Jonathan. Please welcome him. Jonathan. Yes. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us in person and via Zoom. Uh, welcome to our research seminar. Um, just to remind you, for those of you on Zoom, um, you will be muted for security purposes. We're doing this through a, web a webinar and not just a regular Zoom. Uh, to ask questions on Zoom, use the Q&A function. Um, and so we'll be moderating that and I'll be uh, asking the speaker your questions. So definitely participate through that. Um, and so um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ricardo Contreras. He is the Executive Director of Casa Latinos Unidos um, here in Benton County and an adjunct professor at Oregon State University as well as Pacific University. He holds a PhD in Applied Anthropology from the University of South Florida. His career has been at the intersection of applied research, activism, and teaching on topics related to Latino and Latinx communities in the United States and communities in Mexico and Guatemala. I've also had the pleasure of working with Dr. Contreras in various projects, so we run into each other a lot, uh, in partnership with the Youth and Young Adults Corps um, at the Holly Ford Center. He's leading a project to train high school youth in participatory action research. So we're really excited uh, to help and, and collaborate on that project. He's also a member of our guiding team um, for our Transforming Academia for Equity initiative in the college, providing expertise about how to amplify the impact of our work within our institution and across Oregon. And so uh, today, Dr. Contreras is going to be presenting on his work uh, about how community organizations are creating and driving um, impacts uh, and making changes to bureaucratic structures. And so, Ricardo, I give it to Thank you. you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Marie, for the invitation. And everybody here and everybody uh, who is somewhere around the world. So, um, <clears throat> I gave this title to the presentation uh, maybe a week and a half ago, uh, but as it's sometimes uh, uh, common, uh, the title changes as you get closer to the, but I think that it's still valid to a, a large degree. So what, what will I do? Uh, I wanted to uh, use this as an opportunity for reflection because I've learned through the years that when I make presentations, I, uh, I, I, I kind of think new things that I hadn't thought before. Uh, I, and rather than prescriptions of, of what I think should is right or wrong, it's just uh, reflections that are now in process going on with me. And this is a good opportunity to uh, make them explicit and, and, and perhaps get feedback from you, but also get feedback from myself. <laughs> I give feedback to myself when I, when I talk. In this uh, in these types of context, so it's really reflections about. Uh, let me see. Uh, I, I direct a community-based organization, so a community-based organization because it's driven uh, by 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 residents to some degree, community residents. But there is always a challenge, right? When organizations become more uh, complex, more specialized. Uh, they increase uh, their budgets. There is always a, a challenge or a risk of becoming bureaucratic entities that distance themselves from the community. So the reflections have to do with that, right? With how do we do to, to stay true to the idea that we are a community-based organization? And I, I, I think that um, uh, the centerpiece of that is the notion of, of participation, 
right? So uh, I'm going to be reflecting about uh, that, what I just said, and also the approach to community-based interventions that, 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 that articulate uh, in uh, uh, program development and evaluation strategies with the common purpose of strengthening organizations. Um, and as I said, these reflections happen within a context of what I am doing now, which is directing this uh, community-based organization that is called Casa Latinos Unidos uh, here in Corvallis. So first of all, how do we define a community-based organization? Here I did something that uh, many people do, that is go to Google and type down community-based organizations. But I found this, this definition very nice. Uh, different from others that I found. And this is by the National Community-Based Organization Network. Uh, and I found it, uh, which is by uh, the, uh, uh, um, um, the, the American Public Health Association. And uh, I found this in a website of, of University of Michigan Public Health. Uh, it's an organization that is driven by community residents in all aspects of its existence. Uh, the majority of the governing body and staff consists of local residents. The main operating offices are in the community. Uh, priority issue areas are identified and defined by residents. Solutions to address priority issues are developed with residents and program design, implementation, and evaluation components of residents in, in, intimately involved in leadership positions. Okay. So this is this is a definition of community-based organization that I think is very is very good. Okay, because it really has to do with power, right? Who drives the initiative? Who drives the organization? Now, our organization does not necessarily comply with all of this, right? But it's a work in progress. Um, now, what is Casa Latinos Unidos? Casa Latinos Unidos is an organization that was founded in 2009 uh, here in, in, in Corvallis by a group of uh, residents uh, led by a professor from OSU at the time, uh, Dr. Elinda Gonzalez Berry, who uh, was at Ethnic Studies and I believe that she was at the time the chair of ethnic studies, or around that time she became the chair, but now she is a retired professor from OSU. Um, the, 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 the mission of the organization uh, is to strengthen the community from within. So we want to make a distinction between an agency that provides services and provides solutions to an agency that works with the community from within. So it's kind of embedded in the community in a way. It was born out of the community, and I think we are making efforts to keep it within the community. And that's what I will be talking about now. Now, uh, we, we are currently uh, uh, based in two systems. One system is the, the school system. So we are we have partnerships with the Corvallis School District and the Greater Albany Public School System. Our headquarters, our main office, which is a very nice room, half the size, <laughs> uh, is with at Garfield Elementary School, um, and we have been with the school, Corvallis School District, since 2018, more or less. Before that, we share an office with the Multicultural uh, Center in a building that does not exist anymore. <laughs> it's a beautiful building. That what did it become? A uh, 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 parking space. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's sad. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we are, we are, we our main offices are there. We are integrated into the school system uh, in Corvallis. We have a partnership with the Greater Albany Public School System. So we have a community health worker uh, uh, working at their welcome center. But we also started a new model that has to do with uh, working. Uh, with housing developments. So we have a partnership with the Farm Worker Housing Development Corporation so that one of our team members uh, can work uh, at Colonia Paz, which is a new housing development for farm workers that was inaugurated a few months ago uh, in Lebanon. Uh, that that uh, housing development has two phases. Uh, the first phase is open. So we have somebody working there, uh, providing wraparound support to families. Um, they are all farm workers, but uh, they, they have to be US citizens because of the funding that the farm worker housing development receives, corporation receives. And the second phase that will be inaugurated most probably early next year 
um, will open up and will not be only for US residents. Uh, so there is a tremendous, tremendous potential there. So we, we will be the, where we are now and we will continue to be uh, the organization that provides wraparound and system navigation support uh, for uh, the families living in that complex. There will be hundreds of families. Uh, I just got an email today from another uh, affordable housing um, organization that was approved to build new housing development here in South Corvallis. And we will be also embedded, if I can use that word, although that word reminds me of the Iraq war, the, you know, the, 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 the military was embedded in, 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 or the social scientists were embedded in, in the military, but that's not what I mean. <laughs> uh, but we are gonna be working also uh, at that housing development. And there is a third one, which is uh, Third Street Commons, that will be uh, was already received funding. Uh, it is uh, led by a nonprofit organization, Housing First, and we are one of the partners. And we will be there also. And that housing development is for uh, homeless uh, residents. Uh, but according to the statistics that I was shown the other day, about 40% of the population in housing insecurity uh, is Latino, Latinx. Uh, I. I that's what information I was given. Um, so there is a real need for us there. So what, what, what is happening with us is I think that we are uh, getting more and more into these two systems, the school system and housing developments. Um, this is a photograph precisely from a health fair that we had in, uh, in Lebanon at Colonia Pass a few months ago. Now, how, uh, based on that definition of community-based organizations, how is, uh, how is uh, CLU uh, Casa de los Unidos a community-based organization? Uh, first of all, the board of directors, they're all people, uh, Latinx people, Latino Latinx. Uh, I still use the word Latino in case you have noticed, because when we talk with people in the community and, and they refer to themselves, they will not normally use the word Latino rather than Latinx but I know that Latinx uh, is, is, is now what is being used. So I, I use those too. Uh, the staff members are people who share common life experiences with the people with whom we work. So that is critical. So I, I remember interviewing uh, uh, somebody who we're, we were about to hire and finally we hired uh, asking, well, why would you like to work with us? And she said, well, my parents came from one from Mexico, the other one from the uh, from from um, um, Dominican, no, it's not Dominican, from, from El Salvador, sorry, El Salvador. And, um, and I, in my childhood, I experienced the struggles that people with whom you work, that they experience. So I feel very much uh, connected and identified with those struggles. So that is a characteristic, I would say, of the people uh, uh, that work with us. So from that point of view, I would say that these team members are, uh, are the community. I would say that they are equivalent to the community. We cannot make that distinction so clearly. Uh, another way in which we, I think that our organization uh, could be defined as a community-based organization is because um, we are making efforts to, in a systematic way, uh, incorporate the point of view of people from the community, and by that I mean people who do not work in agencies or organizations, but the lady who, who works, who's at home, who takes the children to the school, uh, etc. you see, uh, to incorporate them and their points of view in our program planning and implementation, and eventually uh, in our program evaluation. So if you, if this was a, a whiteboard, you can think of Casa Latinos Unidos here, you can think of the community here, and, and uh, there was a need to have a, a representation of people from the community so that they can think of ideas for grants and, and projects and that we can collaborate to implement them. Uh, so we have two projects that are going on in that, in that, in that direction now. One is called Leaders. leaders. Uh, that is a, a funding that we received uh, to, uh, to develop leadership. So when I started in the organization early this year, well, I thought, okay, what is leadership, right? 
Uh, and given my, my background, I thought, well, let's have developed leadership in project development. Okay, so we have a, a group of people from the community who get together uh, on Saturdays and they have a lot of uh, fun, I would say. Uh, maybe you know that, Cynthia. And, um, and they think about their communities, they reflect upon their, their, their communities uh, here, Corvallis and, and Albany, uh, and they identify problems and they think about uh, what to do. So we are now at this process uh, tomorrow. Uh, um, uh, building a logic model together of a project that they thought, which is a project that has to do uh, with parks. How do we make parks safer? And that project, of course, uh, came out of their own identification of safety in the parks as, as a problem. And the second project that I think that keeps us connected to the community rooted is one that uh, Jonathan made mention uh, that is Jóvenes en Acción, Youth in Action. It's a, it's a grant by OHA, OHA Youth Advisory Council. And we are working with uh, SAFE, which is uh, Students uh, uh, Advocating for Equity, a group of students at, um, at the Corvallis School District. Uh, and we are engaging with them in a process of um, researching uh, their communities, identifying needs, and uh, making plans for action, for change. Uh, so that project is very, very interesting. Both of them, uh, leaders and youth in action, they, they connect. Uh, they are part of the same approach of encouraging and, um, and uh, uh, let's say, encouraging and, and developing a, a participation from the grassroots in, the, in, in pro program planning. And, and program planning and implementation and hopefully evaluation. Um, okay, so I've been thinking a lot about what is the community with which we work, right? And, you know, in the 80s and 90s, there was this idea of comprehensive community initiatives, but mostly in urban settings in Chicago and so on. Uh, but but uh, 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 initiatives that address uh, the, the community in a comprehensive way, in a holistic way. So how do we define uh, this community? I would say that the social determinants of health could help us uh, come up with a comprehensive view of, of the community. Uh, so following the, you know, the social determinants of health, economic foundations, we have issues that have to do with employment and income. So we have a rent assistance program uh, that reminds us every day uh, how vulnerable is, are the jobs of people in the Latino, Latinx community. Uh, people who perhaps get sick one day and as a result of that, they lose their jobs, right? It's not, it's not like, like other people uh, like me, for example, if I get uh, sick, I, I, I think that the board of directors would allow me to get sick and keep my job. But there are other circumstances, other people that, that do not have that. So we are reminded every day when we receive a request for rental assistance about that vulnerability. Um, there are vulnerabilities related to the built environment, houses, transportation, parks. And I mentioned parks here, as, as a, and these are just examples, I would say. Parks, because of the fact that uh, how this community uh, committee uh, that is working with us uh, identify precisely safety in parks as a main issue. And one of the ladies in the committee also thought, talked about how is it that walking her street at night that does not have lights, public lights, uh, how, how, how unsafe she feels. And we are reminded every day when we have events how people do not have transportation to go to the events. Uh, social relationships. Well, there is the issue of isolation. And, and here we're talking, let's make a reference to uh, immigrant communities, people from uh, that have immigrated. Um, for example, mom speaking people from Guatemala uh, who do, do, do perhaps uh, um, face uh, isolation in some ways. Uh, so that is an issue that we need to address, and we are working now on a grant proposal to, to address that. Uh, uh, the notion of horizontal integration that has to do with, with building uh, social networks of support, 
uh, that has to do with isolation. If I'm isolated, I'm not connecting with my neighbors, with my friends. Maybe at church, there is some, there are some connections. And also the issue of vertical integration. That is, that integration with the larger system, right? Um, we had a very successful project this summer, uh, two months. Uh, on Saturdays, we took, uh, we, we had children and families go to the riverfront commemorative park downtown, right by the, by the farmer's market. And, um, uh, and I was looking at the numbers today, there were uh, 49 families. Uh, there were many, many uh, children uh, going there. And um, um, some of them are people who never have been in downtown Corvallis. You see, there is a saying that uh, downtown Corvallis is only for people who look more or less similar, right? There's not too much diversity there. And these people from this community had not been there before in the farmer's market. So for them, it was, 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 was an opportunity to make that connection. Um, but that particular project not only allow for that vertical integration or connection, but also for horizontal, because there were families who did not know each other, and now they knew each other. So we, we, we hope that those relationships will stay and that will strengthen uh, those families. Uh, education, of course, education is a big, big issue. Language, parent participation, academic supports, discrimination. Uh, we are now writing a grant proposal that we plan to submit next week. Uh, together with the Corvallis School District on after culturally specific after school activities. And we will have to be dealing with those with those issues as well. And, and healthcare, I would say access, use and knowledge about that. So that if I could use a, a, a kind of a, a mechanism to represent the notion of, of a comprehensive system of, of of, of community needs, community issues, uh, I think this could help uh, us using the cultural determinants of health. Um, now, based on that, how do we approach the community? So we cannot approach the community uh, from one point of view only, addressing one issue only. Because if we do that, then we're gonna be ignoring this comprehensive, this, this complex system, right? Uh, so, we approach the community uh, through four programmatic areas. One has to do with uh, empowering families through wraparound support and system navigation. Uh, we call that area family empowerment. Uh, many organizations refer to that as simple, simply uh, wraparound services. Well, wraparound services presents a problem that uh, you cannot translate it into Spanish. How can you say wraparound services in Spanish? But, but, but the second problem is that uh, doesn't, doesn't represent the idea that when we do this wraparound, we, in our mind, it's always the intention of strengthening the family. So that's why we came up with the term family empowerment. Uh, build capacity and resilience. So uh, what is that? Well, many times people uh, come to request assistance, for example, rent assistance, but they come one, one month after the other. Uh, we cannot of course, provide support all of the time. We, we are limited. Uh, so there is a, a clear need to work on education, on leadership development, on financial education or, or training, et cetera, a number of different, different areas. Uh, there is the, also the important need of celebrating cultures and affirming identities, right? So I would say that culture is at the center. And in fact, that's precisely what I miss in this slide, culture at the center, and why do I, put culture at the center, uh, not culture as a, as, a, as a, let's say, as an area of need, but just the opposite. Uh, culture as a, as a foundations where uh, people find their strength, right? The knowledge that they bring from their countries, you know, uh, their, uh, the, the, the power of certain values such as the family, et cetera. You see, so uh, culture has to be at the center in everything we do, because that is where is, I think, the strength of, of families, of individuals. Uh, so the celebration of cultures and then uh, creates spacious spaces for decision making. So what has to change is that we cannot just be asked the Latino Latinx community to be, to be told, this is what we are going to do, 
but we need to be present in, in the, the table of decision making. Okay, so that is kind of what, how I envision that we are working. We are addressing community, uh, the community in a comp uh, defined comprehensively uh, through uh, an approach that attempts precisely to do that. Okay. Uh, here are some of the projects that we have and have had in the last year or so. <clears throat> uh, family empowerment, wraparound support, system navigation and outreach. Uh, here we have funding from uh, Oregon Health Authority to work with uh, families affected with, OH, uh, with COVID-19. Um, but we also have uh, financial sources from donations mostly that allow us to support uh, families that um, do not have COVID-19. Now, the notion of systems and navigation is critical, right? And what is that? Uh, that is when an individual who is monolingual Spanish speaking or MAM speaking, for example, um, doesn't understand the system of services, doesn't understand the culture, uh, well, uh, that person uh, faces significant barriers when trying to find uh, a resource that for us could be very easy, easy to, to, be, to, uh, to be found, right? So an example, yesterday a, a, a man came to the office with a letter and the letter, but he was very, very stressed. He was very concerned about the letter that seemed important. But the letter said, no action required in big, big letters. So there was nothing to worry about, <laughs> but he was extremely worried, you see? And that role of us Supporting those individuals is critical. But in that case, we cannot stay just with translating the letter, but we need to make an, an effort to build capacity in that individual to eventually be able to read that letter. That is why building capacity and resilience is so important. Uh, we, we, we started uh, uh, this year, this building capacity and resilience uh, uh, programmatic area. Uh, and this is a photograph of our uh, program this summer in the, in the Corvallis downtown park. Uh, we have had financial education, nutrition education, the youth participatory action research project, leadership development, mentorship projects in partnership with uh, the Mid Valley uh, uh, STEM CTE hub at the Lynn Benton Community College, partnership with the Greater Public uh, Albany Public Schools uh, System. Uh, and that mentorship project is very interesting because we identify uh, people uh, in the community, Latinx people who can be mentors of first generation students who come to college, to OSU and to LBCC. Uh, workforce development, we, we, we just started a project called Why Can, Youth Can, uh, which we have to recruit 10 individuals from the Latinx community, youth, um, to participate in a paid train and work experience program. So that also has to do with building capacity. You see, we cannot stay only in providing solutions. We have to build that capacity. Uh, summer program, we had a great, great, great program in partnership with a, a very important organization in Corvallis called uh, the All Meal Center, uh, where we had for, for, for the whole summer, workshops of different kind, nutrition, gardening, uh, a, a panel on mental health, uh, finances, etc. Uh, music, art, dance. And it was very, 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 very nice. Uh, and we are starting now a, a program on art and music for personal development, really for trauma. <clears throat> it's called um, uh, emergency pedagogy, pedagogia de emergencia. Uh, it's a methodology uh, that was developed. I don't know if you know the Waldorf educational system. Uh, it was developed by Waldorf educators. And it has to do with uh, working with people who have gone through some kind of trauma through art and music. Uh, and the, the assumption is that many of the people who have immigrated, they do come with that uh, trauma. Uh, and I know that because we have talked with people, uh, people, uh, mom speakers who um, who have been detained in the in the border and then finally they came but maybe their families are separated and so on there there is a you know I like to say that we see what is on the table but there is much more under the table uh, and that is what we try to to, to address uh, culture we just had an event at 
at the and a new partnership with the Corvallis Museum, uh, where we had a panel to present a collection of oral histories that we made. Um, uh, we also will be getting uh, a grant from uh, the Benton Cultural Coalition to train people in the Latinx community as museum guides. That project will have will have a role to play in that vertical integration, you know, connecting uh, the Latinx community with such such an important institution as a city museum. Dia de los Muertos, uh, staff member is working on that now. <laughs> uh, and performance is a different defense. And equity and system reform really has to do mostly with my work uh, participating in multiple policy committees and boards, trying to create spaces for, 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 uh, for, uh, for the participation of Latino, Latinx people in decision making. OK, so how do we ensure to remain an organization driven by the community, that is, a community-based organization? If we think of the staff and the community as equivalent, because the team members are from the community, we cannot make that distinction. If we think about them, of the two, as equivalent, uh, then participation is, is, is at the core, right? And participation, I would say, in three dimensions, program planning, implementation, and evaluation. Uh, so program planning, uh, we, we have weekly meetings in which we all get together and we talk, right? And we talk, uh, the team members, and we, we come with ideas. Many times I bring ideas from the meetings that I've been having with partners, uh, but many times team members come with ideas, with meetings that they have had with other partners, right? So, so that process is very interesting. Uh, uh, ideas are coming through this collaboration, these conversations uh, in in uh, in the team, right? In in the if you I don't like the word staff, but in in the team uh, where where we work. But then uh, the community are uh, is staff is the community, but the community is more than the staff, right? And we also have to find ways of of involving the community, uh, uh, not involving as you would say. Uh, you please collect data, but but involving in decision making, right? Uh, and that is in program planning, implementation, and evaluation. And uh, program planning, uh, the two projects that I mentioned, leaders or leaders, where a community of people come together on Saturdays to think about their communities and of solutions, and the other project, the youth participatory research project, both of them are mechanisms to involve the community in program planning, OK? Uh, program implementation evaluation, that's something we have to work more on. Uh, we need to find ways of, 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 of incorporating the community in that as well. Uh, what are the challenges? Uh, the organization has to remain driven by the community, OK? That is the key point, OK? We cannot become a bureaucratic organization that is part of an elite that may say we are community-based organization, but at the end, we are not. You see, that, that is critical. It's very easy to say we are a community-based organization. Um, so keep participation at the, at the center of our practice. Uh, uh, do not over-specialize. I, I don't know what you think about this idea. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I take this idea from uh, community health workers. But uh, what is the, the a key characteristic of the community health worker? Uh, it is the fact that they are uh, uh, universalist. They are not specialists. Even though you may train a community health worker to do uh, cancer uh, uh, prevention, for example, when the person knocks the door and goes into the house, uh, into a house, uh, naturally, the person will engage in conversations that will have to do with the family as a whole because of the fact that they are from the community, right? So we need to be an, make an effort not to over-specialize, I, I think, to keep this, this, this universalistic, I would say, characteristic uh, and to always address the community comprehensively. Now, this presents a challenge uh, for me in particular because I don't wanna give the impression that we are everywhere. And at the same time, we are nowhere, you see? We cannot give the impression that we are doing too many things. So the key is not, is not how many things we do, but the key is the integration 
between the different things that we do. Thinking of that integration as a way to approach the community comprehensively. Okay, so that integration I think is critical. Uh, employ people from the community. Higher education is not always a requirement. Okay, uh, uh, so that is something that we will have to do more of uh, now. Uh, there is a lot of space for collaboration with Oregon State University. Uh, we have at this moment, Mr. Gustavo Esparza, <laughs> a graduate, a recent, very recent graduate of public health who is working with us and, and coordinating the uh, Youth Participatory Action Research Project. Uh, Alma Torres, a graduate from the doctoral program, is supporting us in research and program evaluation. And we have several students who are students of uh, family services, right? Uh, so uh, there is a lot of space for students. I, I envision something that I experienced when I was a graduate student in South Florida, in Tampa. Uh, I was working, I worked throughout my career as a student um, in, a, in an applied research center, okay? Uh, although that center was associated with the university, it was an independent applied research center. And uh, students from, pub, from, from, from public health and from anthropology, where I was, uh, were always coming there. And we always worked there. We got our assistantships, our research assistantships, and we developed professionally in that context. So as a graduate student, I traveled to many, many places around the country, uh, conducting interviews, et cetera. Uh, and I learned so much. I envision Casa Latinos Unidos to be that space for, 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 uh, for students. Um, so uh, I want to say uh, thank you to all of you. And they are saying thank you to you as well. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. Um, and so we'll open it up for, uh, for questions and comments. Uh, both from the folks here and from the people online. Um, and if we would want to start off, I can start off with the questions. Uh, so Ricardo, um, it was an awesome presentation. It's so Thank wonderful you. to see the range of work that you do with the communities. Um, and you know, from coming from the university and from several universities in the past, um, I always see like a tension between yeah. local <laughs> communities and the university. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what we can do as a university, as a college, to develop trust with communities? Well, we all go to therapy together. <laughs> <laughs> and we talk about this. <laughs> uh, but uh, how to develop trust. Um, so one of the typical things that you hear, uh, and it's not something that we say, but that I've heard uh, uh, working on the academia side in the past, uh, from community members that is that, well, professors come and they do their research and then they leave, right? So there is nothing, nothing left. So that is a, uh, it's a typical uh, kind of uh, explanation or, or thing that, I, that, 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 that we hear. Um, I've, I've also heard here in some applied or practice settings here in Corvallis, uh, people, um, when I have, suggested let's do an evaluation of this program. I have heard people step back and say, no, we don't want, uh, they, they see an evaluation, for example, as, 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 as research not connected to their communities, or perhaps they see that as an exercise of taking data and not bringing it back. Um, so what, what I would say is that trust is built by engaging, but engaging in a way in which both players are driving the initiative, are making decisions. And the work that is done by the university has to have an application for the organization, for the community. It cannot be a theoretical exercise that the community will not see any, any results, any applications out of that. So I think that, 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 that engaging, engaging uh, with the uh, goal of, of doing something uh, uh, through shared power uh, and also uh, uh, doing things that will have a direct application. So a few years ago when I was on the board of directors, 
uh, we start of the same organization. Uh, we started a, uh, an internship program with anthropology. We tried to start it. And the idea was that the students would come to the organization, would stand in front of the board of directors and the, and the team and the staff, and they will present their ideas. And the organization would give feedback. The student would do the work, but then at the end, the student would come back and present to the, to the board of directors and, and to the staff. So the student cannot just finish and leave and that nothing, nothing stayed. Um, and I learned that from my own experience doing my master's in, in applied anthropology, when, when I had to precisely go back to the board of directors of an organization and, and present the findings of my study and, and ho hoping that they would do something with what I did. Now, another thing that I would say is that we should approach this as a long-term collaboration, not just specific to individual, uh, individual initiatives or project, but there should be a, a plan, there should be a vision, a long-term vision. Uh, we, we, uh, I, I work under the assumption that nothing can be done alone, right? So there's always a system of organizations working together. There's never, ne never nothing is done with only one organization, right? Uh, and one of those players is the university, right? So the university has to get into the circle, right? Into the system of collaboration uh, with the, uh, with the uh, precisely with the um, working uh, uh, principles that uh, power will be shared, that uh, research will have an application and will stay in the community. And an interesting thing to consider is also is the translation of research into practice, which I think is a field in itself. So we do research, we have the results, but then how do we do to translate that into practice, right? Um, formative evaluation is an example of that, right? Because we, we, we do evaluation research, but the findings of that are always, are always integrated into practice. Right? But it's not just a matter of saying, integrate that into practice. I think that there is a need for methodologies that allow for that integration, right? So that is, it's in itself is an interesting area of work, I would say. Okay. Any other questions from those here? Or we don't have any online right now, but <laughs> any questions from those here? Stephanie. Stephanie. Um, thank you so much for all of this. It was great to learn more about what um, what your organization has been up to. I'm curious if you can share with us some of your thoughts about um, the challenge of um, engaging community members in planning and identifying priorities, given that the existence or the absence of funding so often drives what we have the capacity to do when things cost money to do them. Yeah. And I, I Imagine that it can be very challenging to um, let funding dictate what occurs, but also it's it's challenging to operate without it. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm just wondering how you navigate that with the, the groups that you engage in organizing and planning. Well, these two projects that we have, they do have funding. I always think about that because when I look at myself when I was a recent undergraduate or, or was an undergraduate student in Chile, where I come from, there was never funding, but there were always things happening. And if you think of Colombia, you think of any other country in Latin America, there are very, very interesting community projects happening without funding. But here is different, right? There's always an expectation of, 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 of a monetary uh, contribution to the person. Um, so funding is required. So how do you work without funding? I would say that uh, the premise is that funding is required. It's necessary, right? Because you need to, con uh, uh, you need to compensate in some way to the people to part who participate. Um, but before we get to that point, is 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 all of the work that we have to do to develop a rapport and trust with the communities. So there's much that can be done without funding. I would say. Right, just, just, just devise, think of ways that we can, uh, we can uh, start establishing these collaborations, these connections, these conversations with people in the community 
uh, that might eventually lead to funding. There is one, ex one problem that we are dealing with now, at this moment, okay, that has to do with money. Um, so we had this very nice uh, project in, in, in the park, and we inserted money into the equation in two ways. One way is we, since it was about teaching children about finances, each, each Saturday we gave them $5 in the form of farmer's market coins that they would use to buy things, but then they would save. And at the end of the, of the month, two months, the coordinator would give the, each child but the money that they saved. Another way in which money was, was inserted into the equation uh, was that we decided to offer them to open uh, a bank account with $50 to the children who attended uh, seven of the nine sessions. So now, this morning, in fact, I am noticing what happened with that. What happened is that there is a risk. I hope it's not the case. I don't think it's going to be the case because uh, in fact, there is a video online that I published yesterday that shows this 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 event, and and I think you will notice that that that, that money did not play such an important role. But but it, what is happening is that um, uh, the people who were not given the fifty dollars started to complain, and the word spread. So we decided, okay, we will we will open the bank accounts to all of the children, even those those who came two sessions out of the seven that we had thought. So money was part of that. We thought that it was necessary, but maybe we have to be more careful in terms of determining, well, what is the role of money in a community development uh, context? So to come back to the, the question, I would say two things. First, make efforts that do not involve funding of establishing trust, relationships, conversations, and then when you want to implement projects uh, collaboratively, there needs to be some funding because of the context where we live, but we have to be very careful with how we use that money, not to distort the essence of the, of the projects. And now I fear that maybe the essence of the project, which is establish relationships and learn about nutrition and, 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 and finances might have been to some degree distorted by that problem that we encounter with the $50. I know that this the answer might not be the best. <laughs> oh, no, I appreciate it. I'm sure it's very um, challenging to navigate what, you know, what a good use of money is and a, what seems like a good use and then things. Yeah, it's, it's very, very challenging. But go back to see all of those very nice projects in Latin America, how they do wonderful things with very little money. And we should learn from them. Ricardo, we have a comment here <clears throat> from Allison Myers. Oh, from Allison. Our guiding yeah, team. Yeah. Um, so uh, she says, Ricardo, thank you so much for being here. We are grateful to have you as a contributor to uh, Transforming Academia for Equity, to our Samaritan partnership, and to our entire OSU and local community. Um, and so she wishes she could be here today, but she would very much enjoy your presentation. Okay. Um, and she appreciates you trusting us with your time and expertise. Thank you, Alison, very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and we have another question, which was very related to the funding question about how you contribute and continue to work with communities after funding ends in a particular project. What ways, what are some ways you've used in the past? Yeah, I think that we are dealing with that problem now, not problem, with that issue now, right? We have this great project for the, for the, far, for the park in downtown, but the funding ended and the project ended, but I, we want to continue it for next year. So now what we're going to do is we're going to invite people who participated in that project from the community to join us in conversations about how to make it, to how to replicate it or continue it next year. So. Uh, I think that uh, by um, inviting people from the community who participated, we are already starting to give continuity to this process, okay? Uh, what I would not want to do is to finish that project, close it, and then let's start the three of us to think about what we can do. 
I think that now we need to, to take advantage of the fact that, uh, th that there is now a group of people who is willing to contribute and to participate. So we need to keep that participation. Um, and and uh, keep the participation, but keep the participation in, 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 in project planning, in grant writing, uh, the grant writing process, right? So we are used to us in a small group, uh, and I confess that I always do that, a small group of people think about the grant, but we need to, to start incorporating people in the community from the very beginning. Uh, there is a project to which we will be applying uh, later this month. We want to focus it on the mom speaking community from Guatemala. And we are going to invite people from that community to work with us in defining that project. That's wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Veronica. So um, thank you for talking about the funding you received from OHA. And uh, my understanding is that the CBOs are gonna become more involved in our public health system through the state and prop they're trying to have continued funding and support for CBOs to help deliver some of the public health programming. And what might be some positives or barriers or things, comments you have about partnering CBOs with local public health or the health authority? CCOs, I mean, being now in the, possibly in the mix of all that, and what would yeah. be something that might be helpful for CBOs? Well, precisely yesterday, I completed an application to, to apply for the board. There's a committee that OHA made up, put together uh, a committee to work on CBOs with CBOs. So I hope to be part of that of that team. Um, our collaboration with uh, Oregon Health Authority, uh, with and with the different public health departments, has been very fruitful. I think it rests on uh, the need of us to be very responsive. You know, to complete the reports on time. <laughs> and to, um, to show that we are reliable, okay? Uh, and that is with OHA. And I think that uh, what has happened this year with OHA is that that big COVID-19 project um, opened the doors to other projects. So opened to the doors to two important projects. One, uh, the, uh, the, the OHA Youth Advisory Council that Gustavo is directing, and second, uh, Healthier Oregon, uh, that we are now an organization that is enrolling and providing outreach support uh, in the enrollment for this new Healthier Oregon, Oregon program. So, so uh, I always wonder why do I have to be in so many different meetings, but it's precisely because of that. It's precisely because of that, because by being there and, and trying to say things that are meaningful, uh, we, we built a reputation. And that reputation uh, will uh, strengthen the partnership, OK? If I started to miss those meetings and if we started to miss those reports, uh, then of course, boom, everything would fall. Uh, no matter, no matter uh, how good we say that we are, because, because we're not showing it. So we need to show. Uh, now, that is challenging, right? Because the, the quality of the work of the organization has to do with the, with the fact that we have a wonderful team. Mm -hmm. And um, the team uh, is there, but uh, I want to say something that is funny. And uh, Cynthia, don't, <laughs> I think you know what I mean. But uh, a, part, a, a friend of mine who is, um, who is um, uh, who is the director of a non-profit uh, non organization, told me that many times uh, com uh, health departments see uh, community-based organizations as places where people get trained and become good. Uh, and that is what we need to do in our organization is to improve retention mm -hmm. so that they don't go to the departments of health yeah. after a while. Uh, and, and that is a problem because uh, we have to, to increase retention. We need to have enough funding that allows us to, to provide uh, all of the compensation benefits that people deserve, right? And we grew very quickly. And until last year, we were very small. Uh, and now we are more than that. Uh, so my personal now uh, focus now is to precisely build a package that would uh, allow people to stay with us and not go to the health departments. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. 
So this is probably more of a comment, but I think I wanted to share that a long time ago when I was funded by the CDC and I worked with communities here in Oregon and had staff from the community, a team, I like the word team, but staff, yeah. uh, really made this project successful. You know, without the community team members, this would not have happened. It was funded by the CDC and they had to write reports, which the staff helped. And they got excited and wanted to hear more about the project working with the communities and invited me to go speak to them in Atlanta. Oh. And I said, no, 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 no. I can't do this. I need to bring the team. You know, right. from the community. And so can I bring, you know, and so, but I didn't have the funding, you see, so it was there. So they said yes. So I was able to bring one member of the team, the leader, the, you know, the leader. And it was a, it was amazing. I just want to say that CDC was, I mean, he was amazing speaker. Yeah. And told it like it was. And anyway, the, the lesson learned for me was to put that in my budgets. You know, if I wanted to continue to do this work, make sure I fund um, my team who are from the communities to be able to help. Right. And so I, from then on, I did. And I, you know, I just encourage other people to think about that. But it was a really wonderful. Yeah. Lesson learned for me. Yeah. And I was um, delighted to have an opportunity to. And include them in, in decision making roles. Oh, yeah. Not just to collect data or to participate in the traditional ways that communities have been involved in, in projects, right? But really decision making. Yeah. And if they weren't part of helping with that decision, yeah. we wouldn't have done that. That's correct. Yeah. No, yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Well, we oh, are, Cynthia. Uh, oh, Cynthia. So I'm going to say comment for the long term because as I mentioned, um, but I, I just want to say as someone who who now works for the health department and um, past um, time at Agua de Dios is that it's so very I'm so grateful to um, get to witness the growth of San Francisco and the many amazing things that you've all done in San Francisco and the team. Thank you, uh, and I should add that Cynthia is the one who uh, founded, created the Community Health Worker Program. When, when COVID-19 came in 2020, our organization was very small, okay? Uh, we did not have a Community Health Worker Program. What we had are volunteers who were at the office receiving people's, who, people's calls, and when people visited us asking for resources or, or things like that. Uh, but then uh, we got this funding from IHNCCO, a uh, funding from OHA that allowed us to create this community health worker program. And Cynthia was the first one. And, and you created it and you established the basis for that program to be what it is now. And um, we now, in a few months ago, received funding from Benton County ARPA uh, funding. Uh, to develop the, that community health worker program beyond the uh, system navigation and wraparound and direct services towards building resilience and capacity in the community. Thinking of the uh, community health worker scope of practice from OHA, you know, trying to get to the different columns of that model. Uh, but that is possible because of the wonderful work that you did. Thank you. And the team. And the team. And the team. Yes. And the team. I, I should add, emphasize and the team. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ricardo. I, I really appreciate your presentation and your work with us. It's really obvious that students, um, past students, current students, um, people from all over the university are grateful to your work and we would love to continue to collaborate together. Um, thank you so much for having a you know your presentation here today. Thank you very much and I really want to continue. Thank you.